I first became aware of the effects of depleted uranium through a personal experience and that was that I was walking through a hospital ward in um, Baghdad Children's Hospital and met many children there who were dying of leukaemia and it was explained to me by the doctors that the reason that they were dying of leukaemia was the bad luck of where they were born and that was they'll come from the south of Iraq around the city of Basra and the reason they, um, it was believed, the reason why they had leukaemia was because of the use of depleted uranium weapons there in the 1991 first Gulf War. So depleted uranium disperses into the air as dust particles so it's likely uh, that would have well and truly dispersed throughout that city of Basra and therefore for that community it was a human and environmental catastrophe. So that was back in 2003 that I first heard the story of depleted uranium. Well, depleted uranium is a byproduct or a waste product of uranium enrichment, generally used to, to make nuclear energy or to make atomic we weapons. So it's a waste product, it's uh, cheap, it's normally uh, buried in the ground, which is probably where it should be, because despite its name, it is highly radioactive, of course. So the reason why it's used in conventional weapons um, by a few militaries around the world is because of, of its armour piercing capabilities. So it's extremely dense, so therefore very strong and powerful, and is pretty much able to penetrate and destroy any surface. So as a deadly weapon, it's pretty perfect. So what's happened is the armies are using depleted uranium for either alloy or uses their core, this material, and therefore um, increase the penetrative abilities of the weapons. Depleted uranium was used for the first time widely uh, in 1991 and I guess even the, the US military probably wasn't prepared for what happened next. See what happened next was it not only did it impact the environment in which the DU was dispersed but of course it impacted the soldiers who were firing the weapons. So back in the US um, soldiers started to get sick and develop cancers and tumours and they call it Gulf War Syndrome. Uh, affected many, many hundreds of veterans and their wives started to miscarry, have uh, children born with, with birth deformities. So uh, this was a big problem for the veterans and to this day they're trying to get more attention uh, about this issue that's affected them so dramatically. Since then there's been a bit of an improvement in the hazard awareness of using depleted uranium weapons, but that's for the armies. What we're asking is that that same consideration be given to the civilians of which the um, the weapon ends up being fired uh, in their neighbourhoods and streets and houses. The militaries of, of the world who use depleted uranium, which is mostly the United States, the UK, France as part of NATO forces, it's rumoured Russia may have also used it in Chechnya, but the resistance is, is strong and just when invited to, to declare where the areas in which they've used the weapons, uh, so to have transparency so that the local community is aware of where um, you know, the environment that might be contaminated, there's even resistance to declare where the weapons are used. Uh, the United Kingdom has declared where they've used it in Iraq, um, but their use was much smaller than the United States. So we need the United States to declare what areas they've used depleted uraniums, because those areas are essentially toxic. They're contaminated. You, you don't want to grow your vegetables, you don't want to drink the water there, it will, it will poison um, people's bodies. So I don't think it's too much to ask just to declare that transparency. It seems like their thinking is just total denial. At this point, they're just dismissing it as an issue altogether. They're claiming that there, there is no proven link between depleted uranium and human health. So while ever they're in that bubble, I guess, uh, it's easy for them to remain in that state. And while ever they're not um, researching the issue and there hasn't been any long-term studies of the impacts of depleted uranium um, on soldiers or civilians. So while ever there isn't, they remain in this um, state of ignorance and for them ignorance is bliss and they can just continue to dis dismiss this issue. Uh, the main expression I've seen is 
um, in uh, children and babies, so childhood leukaemia. I've also met um, babies born without arms and legs, so that's common, babies born without limbs or missing limbs, and I've met several of those uh, children. Uh, but uh, at the moment, the major expression of it is uh, birth deformities, and they're expressing itself in different ways, such as spinal issues, spina bifida, um, cleft palate, neurological issues, water on the brain, enlarged skulls, and also a very large number of congenital heart defects as well. No, there's no official acknowledgement. There's plenty of discussion uh, in the general community uh, in Iraq about it. There's um, particular awareness around Basra area. They've been living with this for almost 20 years, this issue, since it was used back in 1991. It's alleged that depleted uranium was used in the city of Fallujah in 2004, and there's discussion of it there. But um, other than some, a small number of studies that have been done, what we're waiting for is a breakthrough, and that is for a large agency, such as the United Nations Agency, to um, announce that they will put resources into this and do a thorough investigation. In Fallujah, the, the US forces in the attacks there in April and November 2004 used particular types of weapon. But what they used widely was white phosphorus. Now, white phosphorus as a weapon is banned under the Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, the way that the military got a, around that in 2004 is that they said they were not using it as, an, as a weapon but as an illuminator. So they would, for example, throw it into a room uh, before entering a room. And these are rooms of family homes I'm talking about because they were going house to house, doing house to house raids. And so they would throw it into the room. The white phosphorus would, um, would illuminate the room. Um, but the problem is it would also burn the flesh off any human being who would happen to be in that room. And so... It took a while for the US to admit that they used um, white phosphorus in Fallujah, but they now have declared that. And so the problem with that is we, we have no studies or research at all of the impact of white phosphorus on uh, human health. Nothing has been done on this issue. We know that white phosphorus has also been used in Gaza by Israeli Defence Forces and also in Lebanon by Israeli Defence Forces. And so it's um, probably timely that some research is done on the long-term impact of the use of that those weapons. Well, the Geneva Convention exists as the rules of war. Does it imply to in Iraq? Not that I witnessed, no. In fact, I saw many, many breaches of the Geneva Convention. The problem with uh, war is that there are no rules. War is chaotic. War is messy. War is horrible. And war consists of um, people who are under stress, under pressure, they make bad decisions, they make wrong decisions, and it's a disaster for all involved. There's, there's nothing orderly about it. There's, there's no rules that anyone um, thinks in the front of their mind as they're going about their business. They're just, the, the soldiers, the people involved, are just all out there to protect themselves. And unfortunately, that means the people caught in the middle, civilians, mums, dads, children, um, the consequences for them are dire because they are always caught in the middle. By far, children are the greatest victims of war. It's, it's always that way. All soldiers are different in terms of how all people are different, but I found there were generally two categories, and that was the, the very shy and... Um, uh, the, the soldier who was less educated and they generally had joined because it may have been an opportunity for them. These are ones who were young, generally blacks or Hispanics, and they were promised either an education or a green card. And when we asked them why they were in Iraq, they, they didn't know. They would say, ma'am, I don't know, ma'am. I, I don't know why we're here. And they were afraid and they were traumatised. Um, and you could see how affected they were. Then there was the other type of soldier who thought he was Rambo, had the moves, had the equipment, sticking his machine gun in as many faces as he could, and he totally switched off from any humanity, sense of humanity, including his own. And so I met also many soldiers like that. They were just bullies. They would boast about how many Iraqis they had killed. Uh, there were many, many of those as well. But in war, I think everyone is the victim, including soldiers. And that is certainly... Um, 
been illustrated in statistics released earlier this year that show that more American soldiers have died by their own hand after returning from Iraq and Afghanistan than were killed in both of those campaigns on the battlefield. So that's a shocking statistic and I don't know what's happening in the US to respond to that but there should be inquiries and a very dramatic response to that. Um, you could imagine the level of trauma you would reach to take your own life and the fact that so many hundreds have done that is, um, is very, very serious. I don't know how hard it'll be yet because he, he hasn't responded formally, so he might uh, respond favourably um, and, and support a yes vote. Um, he may decide not to, so in the next two weeks I'll, I'll have that answer, but I'm certainly doing the best I can to give him all the information he needs uh, to vote yes at the United Nations for greater transparency on depleted uranium weapons. It's not asking too much. This is not a ban on the weapons that may come later in the future. This is just asking user nations to declare where they've used them. So it's non-threatening, it's quite benign, and um, I don't see any reason why Bob Carr would not support this resolution. If he does not support the resolution, there would only possibly be one reason, and that would be pressure from the United States coming to bear on him and his office. And I would like to think that Bob Carr is stronger uh, than that, that he uh, has a sense of independence and that he would like to make his own decision. So I'm counting on that and that he'll see good sense and he'll see uh, um, the logic in this. He's a noted environmentalist and so I want to appeal to, to his better nature and his strength. So I was in Canberra last week speaking to members of parliament and I briefed many of them and shared stories uh, from Iraq and information and I believe they were general, genuinely affected by what they saw, many of them um, visibly so. And since then I know that some of them have researched the issue and have been in, in contact with Bob Carr's office, so I've been informed of that. So I'm very pleased that the members of parliament can see the common sense and see that Australia should vote yes. So, and they've, um, they're planning further representations to Bob Carr's office in the next few weeks. Uh, so now we just need Bob Carr to listen to their concerns. Well, the conflict of interest is everywhere. The hypocrisy is everywhere in this story. What, what we've got is an Australian Defence Force that refuses to use depleted uranium weapons because they're too hazardous. So we don't use them and we don't stockpile them. Secondly, we have a, an agreement with the United States signed two years ago on uranium, which um, the agreement is that uranium from Australia not be used for military purposes and points out specifically depleted uranium. And so the consistency then in that approach would be that we vote yes at the next, uh, the upcoming vote at the UN, because obviously um, twice recently Australian government agencies have expressed caution and taken precaution in relation to uranium. And so it would only be consistent that the next step would be to vote yes. And in my opinion, it would only be consistent then not to export uranium to nations who have not signed the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. I think it's madness that Australia would ship uranium to India. And I don't think uh, Australians approve of it at all. Uh, but at the moment we have a government that's responding to the needs of big business and big mining more than they are to the average Australian and the views and concerns of the average Australian. Doesn't sound very democratic. No, it doesn't sound very democratic at all. I, I, I fear that, um, you yeah, know, as each month passes, each year passes, our democracy gets weaker and weaker and weaker as so we have an administration that just continues to take executive decisions without um, connecting or responding to, listening, being open to the views of, of the people. So therefore we need to raise our voice louder, basically. We need to raise our voice louder and we need to inform our MPs of our views and we need to, if necessary, uh, take resistance. Yeah, well, I think protest and resistance are both very important. I think the first step in expressing outrage over an issue is protest, and that is we let our views be heard. And a great way to do that is together with many other people and to do it en masse as a community to let our views be heard. So um, it can't be known that we were silent. 
uh, Martin Luther King said that, never let it be known that we were silent on issues that matter. And so that's one first step. Now, the problem with that is it's been shown that our governments can turn a blind eye to that and just switch it off and that and they won't listen as, as we just discussed. So then it may become necessary to move from that first level of protest into a state of resistance if the protest uh, didn't achieve its goal. And so that level of protest may mean um, actions that involve civil disobedience, it may mean arrest, it may mean all manner of things, but it can be uh, creative, it can be fun, it can be a um, uh, beautiful experience, it can be prophetic. Speaking truth to power is what it's all about. And so there are so many issues bubbling around the Australian community at the moment that I think we'll be seeing a lot more resistance simply just to get the attention of the, of the government. Oh, you know, for me, that's the million dollar question. How do you um, nourish or get, get within people um, an empathy that, that moves them to action, that, that moves them to care enough to do something? I look around the world at the moment and there are so many issues going on and most of the world are distracted with their TV sets and their, their technology and it's almost as if they are numb or asleep. So... That's why I think at the moment we have a lack of empathy because people are switched off. And so the question I have often is how do we um, engender more empathy in the community? What's the secret? How do we tap into people's empathy? Because I believe um, as human beings we, we have a natural capacity to show love and compassion to others. I believe that's our natural state. But the problem is many of us are not in our natural state. We've been pushed out of our natural spa state because we're not living fully human. We're living something else. And that is a dehumanised life. So how do you rehumanise is a question I'm asking a lot. Yeah, it's a good question to continue to ask, I think.